Hello, and welcome to the watering hole. Thanks for checking out this clip. Don't forget to like and subscribe because that'll make the baby Jesus cry. And I know how much you guys love making the baby Jesus cry. But yeah, anyway. Anyway, that's enough personal crap for tonight. Shall we get on to some news items? Oh, definitely. I can't wait to talk about everything that we're talking about tonight. <laughs> hey, we're, well, we're starting off with some good news. So um, I, we're, we're going to talk about Biden's um, student loan forgiveness. Now, for this, I'm not doing my normal thing where I'm just going to be reading through a news article. I have uh, the, the important part that I'm going to be talking about. I have up here so that you guys can like read through it as I get to it. But um, I'm going to kind of go over I, the information I'm getting. I got from uh, P. Andrew Torres, who is a lawyer who also does a podcast called Opening Arguments. If you haven't heard of it, I highly recommend it. Uh, most of this came from their uh, their episode on this, which I do have linked in the description. So you can, uh, at least I think I linked it in the description. Let me make sure I remember to do that. Uh, yes, I did. So I have this linked in the description if you want to go check that out. It's, it's a great episode. Um, but essentially, I, just to go through the history a little bit of how student loans became what they are now in the States. Uh, so in 1965, Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Higher Education Act, which its explicit purpose was meant to uh, prepare the United States for a post-industrial economy and to narrow the race gap. Um, so essentially to like allow people of color to get into college higher education and start making more money. Uh, Limited Light says, do you want me to pray Bobert away from 14,000 feet or not? Um, Sure. Go for it. <laughs> um, oh, is that's that's do a 14 14 or finally this weekend. Sure, sure, sure. Adam Broughton says no drink tonight. Vice. That's OK. I'll have one on your honor. Sure. Go ahead and drink on my behalf. Um, yeah, I just didn't get around to. Like, I don't I don't have anything in the house right now. I, yeah, I've got what, what I'm calling a shiny Arnold Palmer. So I got a little bit of moonshine and an Arnold Palmer. I have water. <laughs> you know what? I'm I'm at the stage of my life where when I, I I pour my water, I take a sip, and it's gross and warm, and that makes me happy because if it's gross and warm, that means that means that one of my kids poured out the last water from the Brita filter thing, and they remembered to fill it back up. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> if it was nice and cold, then that means it's been in the fridge for a while. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Higher Education Act meant to uh, prepare the United States for not industrial work um, and to narrow the race gap. Uh, so what it did, it funded college tuition grants and it guaranteed low interest student loans. Uh, it also it, like some of these grants are the Pell grants that we're hearing about so much right now. Uh, the immediate yeah. effect was that it tripled college attendance rates. So immediately we saw an upturn from that. Um, now, and in a nice little example of when, when you hear people talk about how uh, all, all, all the political parties are essentially the same, um, we find that uh, when, when we look at the Higher Education Act, it's been kind of bat battered back and forth between the Republicans and Democrats as like, you know, something that they will hold hostage when it's time to do the budget or whatever. Uh, so as mm -hmm. an example, um, during Clinton's administration, Republicans held this hostage essentially was said, well, well, we'll agree to your budget, but only if you add this to the Higher Education Act, which was a provision to uh, make convic convicted felons ineligible for uh, for receiving Pell Grants. Um, okay. And so, but if you think about it, like, for, like who do you want going to higher education? Like, if, if like, I, I would think convicted felons, send them to school, give them better potential to get a good job in the future and they'll be much less likely to have to resort to a life of crime in the future. Mm -hmm. PSLF wiped out six zero 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 nine one zero for me in June. I assume that's the student loan forgiveness. Yes. Public student loan. 600,000. Wait, what? I'm not exactly that number... sure what that because that's that's not even a that's a bar. Oh, oh. Like it's sixty thousand. Sixty thousand. Oh wow. That was a mistype. 
Oh, maybe it was sixty thousand and ten cents. Sixty thousand and nine dollars and ten cents, maybe. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the Republicans made it made convicted felons ineligible to do that under the Clinton administration because they kind of held the budget hostage for that. And then the Democrats did the same thing to the Republicans under Trump. Once they got the like, the, and this was actually in the uh, the the six hundred dollar um, COVID relief package. The Republicans just wanted to make sure that the checks were no bigger than six hundred dollars. And as soon as they got that, they let Democrats write the rest of the bill and they snuck this one through on page two thousand and five of that bill. I like how many Republicans do you think read that far into it? I I, I doubt any read very far into it. <laughs> yeah, and basically as a surprise to no one who knows anything about the history of American politics, uh Reagan screwed this whole thing up by kind of divesting a lot of uh, the budgetary stuff to the state. So it, like it used to be there were a bunch of federal programs and then he essentially said, OK, well, instead of us doing these programs federally, we'll just send the money to the states and then the states can do the programs. Um, but there was yeah. no oversight on that to make sure that the states were actually doing the programs. Um, and then when future sessions of Congress came around for budgets, they just they instead of seeing what the money was for, they were just like, well, we're sending all this money to the states. Why are we doing that? And then they would cut the budgets. And so after 40 years of these repeated budget cuts combined with no oversight, um, it ended up uh, it ended up getting to a place where um Pell Grants, which used to cover 80% of the cost of college, now cover roughly a third of the cost of college. And like I, yeah. I, I ran the numbers, the average public tuition at college is 10,388 uh, and the average Pell Grant is 4,491. So that's uh, around a third. A little less than wow. that, a little more than that, maybe. I don't know. I'm bad with fractions. Um, but but on top of that, like 51 percent of Pell Grant recipients come from families that are earning twenty thousand dollars a year or less but for for the family. Like. That's that's poverty, that is abject poverty, basically, it's impossible to live off of that, essentially, and that's a whole family living off of that. Um, and then, as most people are probably familiar, the DOE, the Department of Education, limits the maximum that you can be required to pay back on a student loan. Uh, used to be that was tied to the poverty line. Um, like you, you had to pay back 10% of your discretionary income and what was considered discretionary income was tied to the poverty line. Um, we're going to that that's gotten some of that's changed. We're going to get into that in a bit. Um, but uh, one of the problems with that was that uh, if you were paying back this minimum requirement, the 10% of your income, um, or if you're below the poverty line, you'd be paying back nothing. Uh, whatever you're paying goes to interest first, and then you weren't subscribed to this channel? John. No, I wasn't. I don't know why. Like, I could have sworn that I was subscribed to it, but then I went to, I looked at the chat, and, I was, and it was like subscribers only, and I'm like, <laughs> what the hell? That's why I did it. No, that's not why I did it. I did that to just kind of <laughs> dial back on some uh, trolls that I was getting in the past. It's like a, it's like a quick and dirty moderation tool. If they have to oh, wait, yeah. no, if they have I, to wait to post something, they generally don't. I uh, well, yeah, no, I, I mean, I do that for my channel as well. I just I didn't realize I wasn't subscribed. I thought I had subscribed like last time or I thought I'd been subscribed for a while, but apparently not. Well, YouTube, I know that YouTube yeah, unsubscribes well, I know that, people, so. Yeah, I know that there are a lot of times when YouTube seems to just unsubscribe you from channels, like if you don't interact with them a lot or something yeah. like that. So maybe maybe that's it. Does, I'm sorry. Does, does being on the channel not count as interaction, you YouTube? Come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, um, if, if you're paying back the minimum on these uh, on these student loans that the DOE is like requiring that you don't have to pay back more than 10 percent. 10% of discretionary income. If that doesn't cover the interest, then you can be making regular payments on it for years and years and years and years. And then uh, at the end of those years, you'll have a higher balance than you started with because they put them towards interest first. And if there's not enough to cover the interest, the loan just keeps growing. Um, yeah. So that is terrible. Um, 
And now even even in this scenario, like debt forgiveness, that's a temporary measure that that helps people that are struggling now. That doesn't really help people in the future because the system is still set up the way it was set up. Pretty much there. There right. have been some changes, but there are some deeper structural issues that still need to be addressed. Um, now, with Biden's plan, what we have highlighted over here, um, when he was campaigning, his campaign promise was to relieve ten thousand dollars of student debt for for everybody. That was his promise. Okay. Um, now, he so he could have just done the student debt thing and nothing else, and he would have fulfilled his promise. But he actually did quite a bit more than that. Um, now, uh, or one of the things I learned from this podcast, is, you know, how, you know, the 2008 market crash, how that was uh, partly caused by uh, all these mortgage backed securities that were being sold. And then when yeah. a bunch of people defaulted on their mortgages, those securities suddenly tanked in value and that tanked the economy. Yeah. Well, I learned that there's this thing called slabs, which are student loan asset backed securities. And if that sounds like it might be the same thing as the mortgage backed securities thing, that's because it is. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, that, that's not good. It, it feels like a disaster waiting. Yeah, that's this is a bubble waiting to pop. Um, so now. Uh, oh, yeah. Another thing. So um, the Trump EO, that was the moratorium on student loan payments that actually expired today. Uh, Biden did a, issue another EO that uh, extends that out to December 31st of this year. But um, yeah, that's that's the final extension. So there's a lot right. that needs to be done before then. Um, but but as part of that, uh, a lot of the things that people are saying, like one of the big problems with it, or not, not really a problem, but one of the things that people are saying, well, well I was diligent and I paid off my student loans. Do I get $10,000 back? Well, here's the thing. If you paid your student loan down during the moratorium, you might qualify to receive those payments back and get them refunded to you. So if you paid off $10,000 of your student loans during the moratorium, um, yeah, you might get it back. Get, Look into yeah. it. I don't know how you would do that. Um, there's probably information on the Department of Education website. Um, listen to the podcast. He actually gives the website to go to. So, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and about 95% of borrowers like it, okay so you know the the people that receive pell grants they didn't just get 10,000 forgiven they got 20,000 forgiven uh 95% right, yeah. of borrowers qualified for the $10,000 and um oh sorry i i wrote this down kind of funny so 95% of borrowers qualify for the $10,000 reimbursement so it's 95% of all people who got student loans that's 40 million people out of 42 million and mm -hmm. uh anyone who got the pell grant gets a total of 20k uh, this actually completely wipes out almost half of student, like the entire debt for almost half of student loan borrowers, about 20 million people. It just completely wipes out their debt. That's huge. Um, now, back to the discretionary income thing where they tie your, your the maximum you can be required to pay back based on um, your calculated discretionary income. It used to be 10%. Now it's 5%. Mm -hmm. um, they have now tied the... Um, They've tied the calculation of discretionary income not to the poverty line, but to a hypothetical $15 minimum wage. So if you make less than $15 an hour, you don't have to pay anything back on your student loans. And they got rid of that carried forward interest thing where now whatever you do pay on it goes to principal first. It doesn't accumulate interest as long as you're paying under this program where you only have to pay the 10% of your discretionary income. So yeah. Got, this just wipes out that whole I made payments on it regularly for a decade and now I owe twice as much as I took out in the first place Yeah. so that actually is a very very big deal right there um, now one of the one of the things that I haven't heard anyone talking about except for this podcast that I'm telling you go listen to now was actually that uh, so people people say well Biden could have just wiped out student loans anytime and why didn't he just wipe out all student debt why is he only doing ten thousand it's like okay well first off his campaign promise was ten thousand then he's doubled that for a lot of people and then done a bunch of other stuff on top of that so he's gone above and beyond what he promised yeah there needs to be more done this isn't perfect but um, 
but also one of the things that uh, people aren't aware of is that the reason this took so long for him to implement and why he really can't do much more than what he has done with this at the moment is because of Betsy DeVos. On January 12th of 2021, just a handful of days before she left office, she decided to fire some parting shots on her way out the door. Uh, she commissioned a memo from the, from the Office of General Counsel that was uh, Pat Cipollone at the time. Um, and uh, so she specifically asked the question, do I have the authority to generally forgive student loan debt as the secretary of education? And the thing about when you, when you commission a letter from the general from the office of general counsel of the White House, that letter is legally binding. Whatever the answer in that letter, your department has to abide by that. And if you want to do something different than what it says in that letter, you have to like you have to have your lawyers draft up another letter with your legal justifications and then run that past the uh, the office of the general counsel and then have them approve it. So like there's this whole rigmarole that you have to go through in order to get around whatever the previous letter was. So Betsy DeVos on her way out, she says, hey, can I forgive student loans? And then Pat Cipollone says, no, you can't. Now the Biden team can't just come in and forgive student loans. They now have to go through all these legal red tape procedures to figure out how they can justify their forgiveness of student loans and say that this is a power that lies with the executive branch. They can't just do it. And so right. that's that's why, like all these times, like, oh, Biden, today would be a great day to forgive all student debt. Yeah, he was waiting on legal <laughs> crap. Right. Um, and so and and. So uh, the justification that they ended up using for this, uh, it actually cited justification that was suggested to the Biden administration by a very progressive left leaning group. They actually drafted a uh, sample executive order for like for Biden saying, hey, this is the justification that you can use for that. They ended up using that justification. So cool. this is a clear instance of Biden actually listening to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and like do, like taking their advice and doing more than he originally had to do. Like, I'm not saying he's great. Obviously, there would have like I would have much preferred a Liz Warren president than than Joe Biden. But we have what we have. Right. Um, and what I kind of want to say here that like. This is this is why it's so important, like sending a message with your vote. Yes, that's an important thing. But yet, like the right way to send a message with your vote is to not sit out the vote or vote third party. It's to turn out in droves during the primaries and vote for the most progressive guy on the ballot or guy right. or gal. I, I'm using guys in the gender neutral term the same way I call my daughter guy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, just vote for the most progressive person on the ballot uh, for the primaries. And then when and then do the same thing at the when the final presidential ballot comes like there's you know there's going to be two guys that actually have a chance of making it into the white house go out and vote for the most progressive of, the, of those two yeah the democrats will often suck it's joe biden but joe biden's <laughs> a lot more progressive than donald fucking trump and like this this is this is a clear indication of it you think you think trump would have done anything like this like no obviously not it was his person that sent the letter on her way out of the office that made this more difficult for biden just out of spite there was no reason for that she had no re she wasn't planning on forgiving student loan debt that was it that was specifically so that she could put a roadblock up for biden well, it, and it's my understanding, um, as far as Betsy DeVos goes, is that she, I mean, she would have been happy if, you know, they just dismantled the uh, Department of Education altogether. Uh, yeah. So it's no, it's no, it's no wonder that she tried to fuck everything up before she left. Yeah. So, but th this is like, it's just like sending a message with your vote. Absolutely. Do it in the primaries and then like this this is a clear example of biden get getting the message obviously he's not as progressive as i would want mm -hmm. but like he he's he's better than i expected he would be and this is like this isn't the like the the climate bill was actually pretty good as well um i know there were some concessions to oil and gas in there but too but um it's still a fucking huge deal um 
but yeah, ultimately, I hope ranked choice voting can be a thing. It, uh, I, I didn't actually get this tweet because it was like a 13 tweet long thread and that would be way too long. But uh, did you see the one with the guy, the Republican guy who went through this ranked choice voting hypothetical scenario? And it started with like, these are these are the breakdowns. It was like, oh, this this place is 41 percent very conservative and such and such percent moderate Republican, such and such percent moderate Democrat, such and such progressive Democrat. Um well, and then, and then I, you... I didn't see I didn't see that I did see a tweet where it, it, it was a guy that said this is what the future looks like with the ranked um, sorry I can't I can't remember the the title for it the, the ranked voting ranked choice voting uh, ranked choice voting uh, he was like this is what it looks like I'm like fucking fine with me <laughs> Adam Broughton says or Trudeau versus Harper or O'Toole or whatever yeah I voted for no actually no Canadian elections are a little bit different um, because we don't have a strict two party system and because we don't vote directly for the prime minister so I didn't vote for Trudeau uh, but federally I do vote liberal because oh wait is it yeah no federally i vote liberal because uh, my riding i always either goes to a liberal or a conservative it never goes to the ndp but um but provincially i vote ndp because my riding always goes to either ndp or conservative um and you like if push comes to shove i'd prefer ndp but uh liberals are better than conservatives so i vote liberal for the federal election because uh those are the ones that actually have a chance of winning But yeah, anyway, I think that cut you off a little bit. What were you saying? I'm sorry. No, 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 you're fine. Uh, I mean, I was just saying that uh, I thought that, uh, you know, how how are they um, figure that this ranked choice voting is going to affect it? It seems like, you know, it's going to better represent, you know, uh, Americans in general, uh, just because, you know, you have so many red states that would turn blue but I mean, that's because if you, I feel like if you truly represented those states as like far as popular vote goes, I'm that's, fairly certain they would be a lot more blue, if not, that's, you know, blue. That's why the Republicans are the party of voter suppression, because they know that the more people vote, the less likely they are to win. Well, yeah. Uh, do you remember that that one Republican guy at, a, I think it was at a Republican National Convention or something, but he... Yeah, I forget his name. It's some kind of weird name, but he said that you know uh, a lot of a lot of Republicans suffer from goo goo government or something like that. It's like good government, and, or goo goo syndrome is what he called it. Good government syndrome, and uh, it, like he's like the more people vote, the less Republicans get voted in, or or the 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 less Republicans are voted for, and so they don't actually want people to vote. They they only want their people to vote. Mm -hmm. is essentially what it is but the less amount of people that vote means that more republican voters are are voting or something like that and so they obviously they obviously have had this in mind for a while to try to su uh, suppress votes especially here in alabama if you've seen the voting map like the districts here in alabama there's one blue district and it's like in it's encompassing the uh, it's got these two like points like it comes to a point it almost looks like a c shape right yeah it comes to a point and it encompasses the two population centers uh two well two of the four population centers in alabama and that's because if you included if like if you drew the maps like reasonably then alabama would have like probably two or more blue districts but you know that's uh, not how the Republicans want it. So obviously they're not going to draw the map like that. Yeah. Yeah. 